you know we are in the house of the Lord. It's Baptism Sunday, and we're going to have a great day together. And uh, there are some folks out of town. And uh, first of all, thank you for not skipping out on the Lord on Memorial Weekend. Amen. Thank you for being here. And uh, I know some of you got to leave early, so we won't belabor anything. But uh, those that, are, that skip town a little bit early, they're going to be a little sorrowful because today is going to be an amazing day in the house of the Lord. Amen. And so we're glad that you're here. I'm glad to be here. But most importantly, I'm glad the presence of the Holy Spirit is here. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Holy Ghost one big hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Grab your Bible with us this morning. Uh, I I don't think I'm going to preach a long time, uh, but I've got something I want to deposit into you today uh, that I believe is going to help everybody in the house. Amen. Amen. I I believe this is a word that is going to equip and empower every single believer in this house today. Amen. How many how many can just, you know, equip me Jesus name. Amen. And so turn with me, if you would, again, to Philippians chapter three, verse 13. We've been talking about the series I press and we're breaking the word press down into an acronym P.R.E.S.S. And uh, and so today is part three. And it's an exciting day. So let's look at Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13 together. Paul said these words, Brothers, I do not count myself to have attained, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press, say that with me, I press toward the prize or towards a goal to the prize of the high calling in Christ. Amen? Amen. And so we began our journey together with a question that the Holy Spirit asked me, and that was this, now that revival has come, will you stay here or will you still press forward? And we believe it's been good, but God's God's something greater, amen? We believe it's been awesome, and can I tell you, can I tell, can I tell you something What God did, here's what I need you to hear, write this, listen to this. What happens in you is what is greater than what happens to you. And I need you to know that just because you might not see it today doesn't mean God didn't do something, boy. Because this is what I need, testimonies are still rolling in from from Good Friday. They're still rolling in from Good Friday. Can I tell you that? So we heard about, I mean, my God, come on somebody. We heard, what a what a testimony. And you know, we were all like, that's wonderful. Let me tell you, if that was your child. Huh? And stuff, crazy stuff's been happening that happened on Friday night. And you might not have seen it Friday night, but it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I heard from somebody yesterday, and since do you remember when God shifted an altar call? And I thought it was just to come and pray. And then it turned into an altar call on addiction. Do you remember that? And do you remember I called out drug addiction? Do you remember that? I laid, I don't want to call them out because I don't want to embarrass them. But I, but I heard from somebody yesterday and they told me yesterday, they said, Pastor Tim, it's been 58 days since I touched an opioid. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. But can I tell you? That's not all that God has for us. Amen. There's more. Shout, there's more. So we've got to press forward. So we began our journey on pressing with the letter P, which stood for pursue. That we would pursue three things. One, pursue the presence of God. Two, pursue our purpose in Him. And three, pursue enemy-held territory. Amen. We're going to build on that today. And then last week, uh, uh, I'm glad to see y'all came back. I wasn't sure uh, if it was too much to handle, uh, but this is what I also believe, that the American people are ready to hear the truth, even if it's uncomfortable. <laughs> Amen? And so, uh, and somebody said to me, you know, the thing that they said about me was they know I'll never compromise the truth of the book. And, uh, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, the message of the Bible doesn't line up with the message of the media. Amen. And it doesn't line up with the message of politicians. But the message of the Bible is the most true and most powerful, the only accurate writing in the earth. 
Amen? And so uh, we talked about that, that, that we are um, being renewed by the Spirit of God, right? And how we do that is we arrest every thought, we protect our ears, and we consume the Word. We have to understand that just because you think it, don't make it right. Just because it comes to you doesn't mean that it's true. And so we have to, and I wanted to spend more time talking about being renewed by the word, but we spent more time talking about not being conformed to the world because that's really the time we're living in is the world's trying to get you to conform to their way, their thinking, their systems. And God is saying, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Amen? And so we're, we, if we're going to press forward, we've got to change how we think. Amen? Got to have our minds renewed. Which brings us to today, the letter E, which stands for evangelize. Say that with me, evangelize. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said these words, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. You can also say all races, all ethnicities, all people, all socioeconomic statuses. Right? To make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I command you, which is why we have a baptism Sunday, because God said, preach the gospel, make disciples, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we have to understand that if we're going to go to the next level, we got to learn how to be people who evangelize. The earth does not belong to the enemy. I'm going to say it again. I said it last week. I'm going to, I got scripture for you today. Psalm 24 and verse 1. The earth belongs to the Lord and its fullness thereof, the world and those that are in it. The earth belongs to the Lord. So if the earth belongs to the Lord and end belongs to the Lord, huh? 54 belongs to the Lord. The city of Fulton belongs to the Lord. Town Hall belongs to the Lord. I'm not going down politics. Relax, I'm not going to do politics again. But our town hall belongs to the Lord. Our city council belongs to the Lord. Our men in blue belong to the Lord. Our firefighters belong to the Lord. Our neighborhoods belong to the Lord. Come on, somebody. It doesn't belong to the devil. Fulton does not belong to the devil. The devil's a thief and a liar. He doesn't have any right to anything. Amen? But, but, but it's not just Fulton. This county belongs to the Lord. Amen? Jeff City belongs to the Lord. Amen? Columbia belongs to the Lord. Amen? Amen? We've got to stop giving the devil more credit than he deserves. I've said it last week and say it again. We've got to stop saying certain cities belong to the devil. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen? So if the earth is the Lord's, then we must declare as the song said, he's the God of this city. Addiction is not the God of this city. Perversion is not the God of this city. Violence is not the God of this city. And what's greater than the principality that rules over this city is the one that rules over the principality, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the God of this city. He's the God of this county. He's the God of this region. And can I tell you, whether you believe it or not, turn off CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, Turn them all off. Because guess what? The nation belongs to the Lord. Amen. Some of them ain't acting like it, but it's still true. They belong to the Lord. Why? Because the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those that are in it. Okay, now I've got to, now I got to, now I got to, now I got to explain something to you now. I've got to make something real clear. It doesn't say that the Christians belong to the Lord it says the earth and those that are in it belong to the Lord we have got to watch our mouths because the power of death and life are in the power of the tongue and we've got to stop saying well this is just the devil's work 
if the church would be the church, the devil wouldn't have any works. You understand what I'm saying? So if the earth belongs to the Lord and those that are in it, then we have to under, listen to this statement. We have to understand this, that to go to the next level, we must develop a passion to win the lost. Because if somebody is in the hands of the enemy, they are being stolen because they are supposed to belong to the Lord. And you and I have got to develop a passion for the lost that starts when we leave the building. A passion that takes over when we go to work, when we go to the grocery store, when we're pumping gas, when we're out and about. Our passion for the lost is not a Sunday thing, it is an everyday life thing. And if we're going to go to the next level, not just in what God is doing, but as a church, brother, you and I have got to get a heart for people because God died for people. Amen? So I want you here to talk about a few things this morning. Number one, the fact that you and I are called to evangelism. I said Wednesday night, some people think that only the office of the evangelist is supposed to evangelize. But we see this in Scripture that Paul told Timothy, who was the pastor at Ephesus, to go and do the work of the evangelist. Not because he was a pastor, but because he was a what? Believer, right? Because he was a Christian. He is supposed to do the work of the evangelist. The evangelists are not supposed to be the only ones evangelizing. You and I are called to evangelize. Amen? So I want to talk to you about what does it look like to be called to evangelism? Number one, it means we are commissioned to go. We are commissioned to go. You cannot wish for people to get saved. You've got to go get people saved. It used to be that you would pray and pray and pray and, and the unbelievers would come and knock down the doors of the church and say, please tell me what must I do to be saved. But, but we're not living in that day anymore. So the reality is, is that if they're not coming to hear the gospel, the gospel has to go find them. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Go is at the root of gospel. And if you take go out of gospel, all that's left is a spell. Mm, okay that went right past us you understand what i'm saying because christianity in america has become lazy oh i'm, I'm about to i'm about to upset some folks i thought i was gonna be good today why do you do this to me lord uh-huh because the jehovah's false witnesses got no problem going the mormons got no problem going but the people with the truth have a problem going. Because the reality is, they are telling the lie better than we tell the truth. Because we don't go. Because we've settled into, as long as I'm alright, everything is alright. But what if I told you that God wanted you so pregnant with winning the lost for him that every time you saw somebody, it wasn't the color of their skin, it wasn't their hairstyle, it wasn't the car they were driving that made you perceive them, but it was actually the condition of their soul. You are commissioned to go. Go get them. Go get them. Go get them. Amen? We must go to where they are because they're not coming to us. Revival, write this down, revival requires movement. Say this with me, just go tell somebody. Man, just go tell somebody. You know, I was talking to, I was talking to Greg a few days ago, and you know, what I love about Greg's man, man, he'll, t he'll talk to anybody about anything at any time. I love it. I love it. And, and you think, you go to Quick Park, man, you think you're going there for a mower and you're about to get the gospel. Huh? And God help you if you work there. Can I get, be careful, don't say amen. Just, just smile. Just, but you know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's not a Greg thing. That's not an Angela thing. That is a kingdom thing. To tell somebody of the truth of the gospel. I remember and you know, it's so unusual that sometimes it can take you off. It can take you kind of like, whoa, what's, what, what's going on? 
When we were in Ohio, I went to this store called Meyer. Meyer is kind of like a super Walmart. And I went to Meyer and I got in my car and this lady comes to me. She goes, she goes, are you born again? And I was like, how dare she ask me? Right? Because I was like, what's going on? I'm like, what is what did she see about me that made her question whether or not I was saved? And then she goes, I said, I'm, I said, I'm sorry. She goes, do you know Jesus? I said, yes, ma'am. Woke me up this morning, been singing to him all day. Yes, ma'am, I do. And she's like, well, praise God. And then she looked at me and she goes, then go tell somebody. I went. And at first, I'm like, you're not supposed to tell the preacher what to do, but I wasn't her preacher. And I, then I just went into Meyer and I was just rejoicing because somebody was out there in the parking lot in the hot sun wanting to find somebody that didn't know Jesus. Go tell somebody. Because guess what? If you don't tell them, nobody else will. Amen? But not only are you commissioned to go, but watch this. Number two, you are compelled to influence. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In other words, Jesus said, go evangelize the world. Proclaim the gospel and offer salvation and freedom in Jesus Christ. Go influence somebody for the gospel of the kingdom. Because we influence people in a lot of different other things, but we're not influencing for the gospel. You know? I mean, I mean we, we, we have no problem talking about anything else that we want to talk about, but then we clam up when it comes to Jesus. But can I tell you, Jesus is worth talking about more than anything else. I'd rather talk about Jesus than politics. I'd rather talk about Jesus than sports. I would rather tell you about Jesus than argue with you about who's the goat. Amen. Everybody knows Jordan's the goat. End of discussion. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> but we talk about all these other things. But why aren't we telling somebody when we've got the best news? That it, Do you know what gospel means? Gospel still means the good news. The good. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 4? Go, I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. What is good news? What is the good news? The good news is you're on your way to hell, but through Christ you can escape hell. Amen. The good news is you're sick, but you can be made whole. The good news is you're an addict, but you can be set free. Amen. The good news is what you always were, you don't have to continue being a moment further Amen. than right here, right now. To go tell somebody. Because you have to get a, a mentality in a picture in your heart of lost humanity. That every day in this city, in the city of Fulton, every day, somebody, somebody, somewhere is crying themselves to sleep because they have no hope because nobody has told them the gospel. Somebody is going to kill themselves tonight because they don't find life worth living because nobody is telling them the gospel. Well, thank God for a bunch of crazy Victory Fellowship Church folks that are going to go walk the city and tell the gospel. Amen? So not only are we commissioned to go and compelled to influence, but number three, we are called to impact. What are we called to impact? We are not called to impact the church. The church is called to impact the world. Where can we have an impact? Number one, we can have an impact in this community. Where in this community? Number one, in our businesses. In our businesses. If you are in business for yourself, you are in business for Christ. If you're a business owner, it is more than building your own kingdom financial kingdom but you are put in a place of influence to influence others and to spread the gospel and we've got to take the business world back for jesus christ amen but we're also called to impact the school systems I, I i don't think that the church is supposed to be absent from school boards i think we need believers on school boards amen. i think we need school district superintendents that are full of the holy ghost amen. we need principals full of the holy ghost teachers full of the holy ghost but pastor you don't understand you don't know my teachers well spread the gospel to your teachers 
when you have a parent-teacher meeting. Don't just go in there talking about their grades. Go in there and let your light shine and spread the gospel to them. Because what would happen if every single educator in the system all of a sudden challenged the system and said, no, I'm not teaching that anymore because it's not biblical. What would happen? The school system would have to get turned over. I'm praying God would send a revival to the school system and turn every school inside out. Amen. But it's not just business. It's not just school systems. God also wants us to impact the political systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the political systems. And I I talked enough about politics last week. I'm not going to spend a long time here. But I just have to say this. The church is not supposed to be silent when the political systems are anti Christ not the antichrist but anti Jesus you understand what I'm saying we are not supposed to keep our mouth shut when local politics is pushing an agenda to slaughter innocent lives we are not supposed to keep our mouth shut we're not supposed to gather around in kumbaya while the world is going down a road that leads to destruction if we don't speak up for babies who will Amen? And it's not just abortion. It's every other thing. Every other political system that is corrupting our children and we've kept silent and we've shut down and we thought praying wasn't enough. But praying isn't enough. We've got to stand up, speak up, and impact and influence the system. Amen? Because wishing for change won't happen. And I'm not willing to sit by for two and a half more years while the politics of the world continues to corrupt our nation. Why doesn't the church stand up, speak up, and go make a difference out there? Amen? Let's move on. I'm starting to get my flesh now. Let's just move on. Was that three? Yeah. Number four. The fourth area we are called to influence and impact. We've got our businesses We've got our schools, we have politics, and then one of the most important is the media. Can I I just encourage y'all to something? And I don't do a great job of this, so this is something I've got to make a change in. Let's stop using social media for complaining. Let's stop you. Now, you may not have access to a major media outlet, but you've got access to social media. So why don't we start flooding? Because we, we like to flood social media with whatever it is we don't agree with. We love to, to flood social media with our complaints. And, and the thinking is, well, if I don't complain, nothing will change. But I found that if I complain, I remain. But when I praise, I get raised. So I would rather flood social media with the truth of the gospel. Why can't we just, why can't we overflow Facebook with scriptures? Sharing videos of sermons. I know some pretty good ones you can share. Huh? Why don't we do that? Why don't we stop complaining about people in power we don't agree with? And why don't we start praying for people in power we don't agree with? And here's, here's the thing. Oh, I'm praying. I'm praying. Really? How are you praying? I'm praying God remove them. God strike them. God, even if you have to kill them, get them out of the way. And that's not kingdom. Because your Bible says pray for those that are in authority, even if you don't agree. I got pulled over once. Is Sam here? No. Okay, I can tell it. I got pulled over once. A long time ago, and I wasn't speeding. I wasn't. I wasn't speeding. I got pulled over, and when I got pulled over, they accused me of doing something I knew I hadn't done. And I love the police, but I don't know what was going on. But it wasn't me he was going after. (laughs) And I got real upset. I wasn't in the spirit, Stephanie. I was in my flesh at that moment. I was real upset. And in that moment, God asked me, he said, what are you going to do now? And I had in my brain some words I'd like to share with this officer. 
And some of y'all laughing at me because you're so holy and righteous. This ain't never happened to you. But it happened to me. And I was either going to bless him up one side and bless him back down the other. Can I get any honest church folks can say, I know what you mean, Pastor Tim? Or I was really going to bless him. So when we were done, I sat there praying. And he was in his car for the longest time. And I was like, Lord. And, I, and you know, this is, when, this is when church folks really start to pray. God, you get me out of this. I'll never do nothing again. I'll never <laughs> And I prayed. I didn't pray that. I said, Lord, I said, vindicate me. You know I didn't do anything wrong. So he comes back and he goes, well, I'll tell you what, sir. I'm not going to do anything today. But let's, let's just slow down, all right? I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, all right. He said, you have a good day. I said, can I just say something? See, this is when they tell you, keep your mouth shut, roll up your window and go on now. And I said, can I just say something? He said, uh-huh. And I said, God bless you. Thank you for keeping our streets safe. And I drove off. And I drove off. And can I tell you something? That is not what I wanted to say. Some of y'all never come back to this church because Pastor Tim's ungodly. Let me tell you something. First of all, this is a long time ago. I have matured in the Lord. <laughs> but we have to, yeah, we can have it. So we have to understand. But that's what I, because what witness, what light is now shining? If our response is, what do you, what do you pull me over for? Because I was with somebody and that's what happened. He pulled him over and he, and he should have because this dude was speeding. And, but he was, he was going like 12 over. And, he pulled, and I was like, you need to slow down. But he was my boss, so I was also shut up. You know, like you do what you, you, do what you got to do. So the trooper pulls him over. We were in Georgia, and he's like, do you know how, how fast you're going? He said, yeah. He said, I was going 82. This is a 70. I understand. And he goes, no. He said, you were doing 89. And he goes, and he said, no, I wasn't. And I was like, oh, we going, he going to jail. I'm going to have to drive. I don't know what's going on. And he, and he goes, no, I wasn't. And the, and the policeman was like, he goes, well, if you think there's something wrong with my radar, feel free. We can do a diagnostics test to make sure it's accurate. And he goes, yeah, do that. All right. So then he comes back and he goes, well, sir, I just ran the diagnostics test. And as it turns out, it's 100 percent accurate. And I'm sorry, but you were going 89. And then he mouthed off at him. And I'm like, dude's going to jail. He is going. To. And I thought I thought at that moment. But because he's an unbeliever, that would be his response. But how many believers have the same response that even when you are in a high pressure situation, God still wants you to shine. Amen. Watch this. Not when you agree, when you disagree, that's when your light has to shine. Amen. Amen. All right, let's move on because nobody likes talking about getting pulled over by the cops. OK, say it with me. It's time for the church to shine. Say this with me. If not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And if not here, then where? Come on, say it again. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? Ladies and gentlemen, if we don't go do it, nobody will. We got to go spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want to help you today, and I want to give you three tools for effective evangelism. Because how many would say, I want to win the loss, but I just don't know how? Right? Because we do this all the time. Go, go get somebody saved. But nobody ever tells you how to get somebody saved. This happened all the time in our church in Ohio. They would come to me with a train of people, and they would say, Pastor Tim, I did it. I'm like, what did you do? All these people want to get saved. I'm like, praise God, do it. And they're like, well, I brought them to you so you could get them saved. Now, I'm happy. I'm happy. They're actually talking to folks and bringing folks. But what if I told you, you didn't have to be a fivefold office gift to get folks saved. You didn't have to bring them to church to get them saved. You bring them to church after you get them saved. Why? Because you don't just get people saved, you got to make disciples, right? 
But, that, but we do that because we're intimidated. We're scared. We're overwhelmed. We're, we don't want to mess it up, and we don't want to say something that would cause that person to never get saved. So I'm going to tell you, before I give you three effective tools to evangelism, I'm going to tell you how not to evangelize. Okay? Number one, this ain't in my notes. This is on the fly. This is a little extra barbecue sauce for your chicken. Okay, you ready? <clears throat> Number one, you don't start by preaching to them about hell. You saved or you going to hell? <laughs> my wife's grandmother, when her son was not saved, every Sunday morning, he was living at home after the service, and she'd wake up every Sunday, Andy, you coming to church today? You going to go to hell? Is that true? Right? That's not effective evangelism, is it? I've been with people like that. They'll go up to a random stranger. Excuse me, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus. Oh, oh okay. Is, is he the Lord of your life? No. Oh, so you're going to hell. That's not going to make somebody say, oh, please tell me the truth. Because here's the, here's the reality. Most unbelievers deny the existence of hell. And they're no longer scared. And other unbelievers think that hell is going to be a party. Right? The stupid slogan. You know, what is it? Uh, heaven wouldn't take me and hell didn't want me. Let me tell you something. Hell wants every single person walking this planet right now. But you don't lead in with that. It's like, oh, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ in your life? No. Oh, so you want to go to hell. You want to burn forever and ever, and you want to hang out with Satan. Is that right? <laughs> That's not effective evangelism. Number two, effective evangelism doesn't escalate the position of the church over the cross of Jesus Christ. You need to get saved. Why? Because you need to join Victory Fellowship Church. That is not, that is not effective evangelism. Thank you. It is not <laughs> effective because it's not about the church. It's about the cross. Right? We talk to them about church after they say yes to Jesus because we have to make disciples, not just win the lost. All right? Number three, if you find an unbeliever, you don't walk up to them and witness in tongues. <laughs> Y'all laughing at me. I'm preaching it because I've seen it. Ooh, there's an unbeliever. Stop it. Shut up. Be quiet. You know what? Stay home. Because you're not helping the rest of us. Right? What did Paul say? He who speaks in tongues edifies himself or the body unbelievers aren't going to receive anything from your tongue you know what they're going to receive mm -hmm. uh-huh we don't need no granolas out here trying to get people saved somebody on wednesday night tell me what a granola is fruits nuts and flakes we need people that will win the lost because they love the lost so how do we do it number one you can win the lost through power evangelism. Power evangelism. An example of power evangelism would be Good Friday. It is when you have an atmosphere where signs, wonders, and miracles are taking place. And the power of God is on display and the power of God is undeniable. Right? Because here's what's going to happen. When you get a preacher so drunk in the Holy Ghost under the healing anointing that he can't stand, and it takes three large men to hoist him up, one or two things is going to happen. The unbeliever is going to say, I don't know what's going on around here, but I got to get out of here. Or the unbeliever is going to say, I don't know what that is, but something's going on, and I want that. Right? Power, because when there are signs, wonders, and miracles, it makes an unbeliever say, maybe God is who they say he is. And when his power is on display, it's undeniable. What you going to do? What you going to do if you're an atheist in this place and you see somebody on a cane walking up, can't hardly move, and then is up here sitting, and all of a sudden, in the power of God, the preacher says, you all right, brother? And he throws down his cane and runs out the middle aisle. You're not going to be able to say, God isn't real. What you going to do? Somebody in here is stone blind. All of a sudden, they start seeing. 
undeniable fact, undeniable exhibits, displays of the power of God. And it's a powerful tool. I remember I was in a revival one time in Indiana, and we had about eight people that night that had their arms and legs grown, and miracles took place, and somebody that was deaf started to hear. And I walked up to this girl. I'm friends with her to this day. I was a teenager. And I walked up to her, and I said, come here. And she, and she stood before me. And I said, before I lay my hands on you, I said, are you a believer? She said, no. And I said, do you believe in God? She said, I do now. I said, How do you, why do you say I do now? She goes, because if that ain't real, then I can't explain it. And she said, and if God can do that to them, I know he can do something for me. And I led her to the Lord right today. She is a pastor's wife. God totally changed her life. Amen. So power evangelism. So, but please understand, this is not, oh, we got to get everybody to Victory Fellowship Church so that Pastor Tim can lay hands on them so that they can fall over and get drunk in the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues and then get saved. Power evangelism is a tool for the believer, not the preacher. What would happen if you met an unbeliever who was in a wheelchair and then you said, well, before I tell you about Jesus, can I pray for you? And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then you lay hands on them. Next thing they know, they're walking and running out that wheelchair. And now you say, now are you ready to accept Jesus? And they'd be like, I'm ready to accept anything you're pushing. <laughs> right? Be honest about it. And so power evangelism is not we got to invite everybody to come to the healing service. Power evangelism says I've got to walk in the healing anointing and go out into the, and go find somebody and watch the power of God on display. But it's not the most effective. It is effective, but it's not the most effective. I'm going to show you. Number two, social evangelism. Social evangelism. I grew up with my mother telling me this all the time because she heard it from her mother all the time. And it's this statement. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So social evangelism is the church leaving its four walls and going out into the community and meeting them in the point of their needs. Watch this. Let me explain something to you. It is not meeting their spiritual need. It is meeting their natural needs, which is why Jesus said what? Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Right? Shelter to the homeless. This is why we have these commands from the Lord, right? Is to take in the widows and the fatherless and to meet their needs because that's social evangelism. And it might look a lot of different ways. It could be down at the county fair, passing out free bottles of water and doing it in Jesus' name. It's, and I know we're behind schedule, it's rolling out a smoker to a city park and inviting the community out and giving them a chicken plate that will set their soul free in Jesus' name. Right? Meeting them at the point of their need. Because what would happen if the church was so blessed that there was a community that was starving because they couldn't afford groceries, and then we go out there and give them a barbecue plate? I know one thing. Most of them aren't going to eat and run. Most of them are going to eat and say, what are y'all doing here anyway? I'm glad you asked. Hold on. And then I'll be like, watch my fire. That means watch the grill so that I can talk to them about Jesus. But it would be my desire that I just keep cooking away and watch my church folks tell them about Jesus. Right? I got the chicken down. Y'all get the salvation down. Amen. All right. And it's meeting people at the point of their need. But you cannot do social evangelism if you are not blessed financially because it takes money to impact communities right and so that's where that is our goal and and you know we're a little bit behind but bless god we're making strides and we're going to get it done amen come on look at somebody and say get her done let's go all right so if power evangelism is the power of god on display then social evangelism is the character of god on display right it's the character of God on display. The character of God that says, 
what concerns you concerns me, and I want to make a difference in your life. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not an event. I was at the grocery store a couple years ago here in town, and I had a cart full of groceries. And there was a man in front of me who was buying a bottle of water, a little small pack of peanut butter crackers, and a small little package of cheese. And he's about 80, 85 years old. And the lady told her what the, what the cost was. Now, this was two, three years ago. So the cost wasn't much. It's not like now. Now you need a 20 spot to buy that. I think it was like $2.85 or something like that. It was just something real, real cheap. And here he went. Digging, counting pennies. Had one dollar and then a bunch of silver and copper in his hand. And he was counting it out. And I said, please stop. And he looked scared. He's like, I, 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 I don't mean to take so long. I said, put your money away. He's like, but I'm hungry. I said, I know. I said, give him his, ring it up, give him his food, and then count my groceries. And I bought it for him. And that is not a great thing to do because it was $2.80-something cents. And I didn't, I didn't need to call my wife and say, hey, is it all right if I bless somebody for $2.85? Right? That's not even a gallon of gas now. Anyway, I'm just going to move past that. I just wanted to drop that on you and move past that. And he looked at me and he said, I can't let you. I said, you can't not let me. He said, why? I said, sir, I said, I didn't do that because I feel bad for you. I said, I did that because Jesus just whispered on my ear and said, bless him. He needs it. And he's like, who? I said, Jesus. And he started to cry. And he said, I can't believe somebody would do something for me. And I said, sir, it was in the name of Jesus. And, I, and he said, can I hug you, young feller? And I gave him a hug. I said, it's all right. And then I said, was well, there anything else you wanted? No, no, this is enough. My wife and I were at a gas station. And this guy walked up to us. Hadn't showered in a long time. Was a hot mess. And I'm sitting there trying to pump gas. And he goes, could I bother you for a meal? I said, it's no bother. I said, what do you want? He's like, a little fried chicken. <laughs> I said, sure. I said, let's go inside. Let's get you some fried chicken. So we go into the grocery store. And he goes, he goes, I got kids, man, and we're starving. I said, get your cart. I said, let's go to the deli. He goes, you going to get me some fried chicken? I said, yeah, I'm going to get you some fried chicken. I said, you want some sides? He goes, I wouldn't be mad at some mac and cheese. <laughs> got him some mac and cheese. And then I looked at my wife. I said, go get a bag of rolls. She got some bag of rolls. And then he goes, I mean, we kind of need some milk and eggs too, but I don't want to be greedy. <laughs> I said, go get your milk and eggs. So he goes and gets his milk and eggs. And then he goes, why are you doing this? I said, because Jesus loves you. And he wants you to know that he sees you when you're struggling. And he just, you know, but how many times do we, reckon, do we not recognize when somebody approaches us, right, what's the first thing we want to do? We went to the gas station and somebody says, excuse me. We're out there pumping gas. All of a sudden. Hello? Oh, excuse me. Hello? hey, how are you? And we fake a phone call. Some of y'all laughing because you're guilty. Huh? Well, maybe it's not that. Maybe somebody approaches you, and now you don't see it as an opportunity to spread the gospel. You see it as an opportunity to protect yourself because you don't know if they're going to shoot you. When did the church start walking in fear? When are we going to be the church? Now, I'm not saying, because you have to have wisdom, I'm not saying every single person that needs it, God's telling you to go buy them fried chicken, mac and cheese, rolls, milk, and eggs. But you've got to walk by the Spirit and know this is a moment, this is an appointment by God to share the gospel. Amen? Social 
evangelism, it's effective, but it's not the most effective. Number three, the most effective, in my experience, in winning the lost, relational evangelism. Jesus was called the friend of sinners. And what the Pharisees meant as a criticism, Jesus took as a compliment. They call him a friend of sinners because Jesus hung out with sinners. I remember when I was a child, I had a family member tell me, they said, well, don't hang out with them boys because they're not church boys and we don't want them to influence you. And I, I grew up to understand light is greater than darkness. If you're weak in your faith, don't surround yourself with unbelievers that are going to drag you down. But when you get strong in your faith, go make an impact with unbelievers, right? Jesus was called a friend of sinners. You and I are supposed to be friends with the sinners while opposing the sin. You understand what I'm saying? And so social evangelism, let me explain something to you. Listen to this. It's outside, social evangelism is outside the comfort zone of casual Christianity. Because social evangelism requires you to view the world through the lens of Jesus and not through the lens of your own religion. Social evangelism is, is no, I'm sorry, thank you. Relational evangelism is when you are with unbelievers, you have relationships with unbelievers, you work with unbelievers, your neighbors with unbelievers, whatever the case may be. Maybe you grew up with somebody that's an unbeliever, now you're a believer filled with the Holy Ghost, and now God wants you to shine light for them. And you can't do it. You cannot do it until you understand something. Are you ready? Sinners sin. So does half the church. Everybody in here has got an issue. I got an issue. You got an issue. You got an issue. But now because somebody else's issue is not like our issue, we now judge their issue and ignore ours. But relational evangelism causes me to love you in spite of your issue, right? Relational evangelism causes me to reach out to you in spite of your issue because your issue is not greater than my issue. Your issue is just different than my issue, right? So relational evangelism causes me to invest in the life of an unbeliever and to win them to Jesus through my relationship with them. Not just my relationship with Christ, but my relationship with the unbeliever. To live your life in a way that makes them say, why are you this way? It's not inviting them to a conference. It's not passing out an invite card to church. It's sitting down at Miss Kim's. And said, let me buy you a plate. Why? Because you're my friend, I want to bless you. And relational evangelism takes time. Because what's going to happen if you, if you meet somebody and you begin a friendship or relationship with them, what's going to happen if the very first conversation with them is, so let me tell you about Jesus, let me tell you why you need to get saved, let me tell you what's going to happen if you don't. You know what they're going to say? Well, I'm going to go ahead and finish off this chicken wing real quick, but we ain't got to hang out no more. Because now I've turned them off. I have got to learn to relate to unbelievers outside the view of my Christianity. You're not going to hear a lot of preachers tell you that, but it's the gospel truth. Because if the only thing you can talk is Jesus, you're not going to be able to connect with an unbeliever. You've got to find common ground, right? You've got to find common ground. You know, it might be the Chiefs. Dude, let's go out for wings and talk football. Awesome. And then you know what? You have the whole entire conversation. Don't even bring up Jesus once. Because you've got to be invested in who they are before they learn who you are. Right? It's like going, it'd be like if you went out on a blind date. And the whole time, you didn't ask nothing about her or him and all you talked about was you. Oh, well, I've done this, and I've done that, and I like to do this. It's like, I don't care how you like to spend your time. Let me tell you how I like to spend my time. Let me show you what, right? You know, <laughs> check. You know? 
I mean, if I ever went out on a date with a girl when I was a teenager and they didn't care anything about anything I was interested in, and the only thing she wanted to tell me about what she was into and what she had done and her, her friends this and her friends that and blah, blah, blah. And thank you so much. First of all, if you're, if you're uh, what's that girl's name from the Cosby's, the friend? Y'all, I know we're not supposed to say Cosby, but y'all remember watching the Cosby's when you were, y'all remember that? Uh, let's not get so religious we forget. Uh, nobody grew up watching the Cosby's. You had horrible childhoods if you didn't grow up watching the Cosby's. Huh? Anybody in here beside me relate to Theo? Somebody, somebody, Dusty, they're too religious to say anything. They're scared to death. Okay? Should we move on? Maybe I shouldn't use Cosby as an example. You remember her friend? It was... Remember the friend that talked so fast, she wouldn't shut up. Thank you, one person. She wouldn't shut up. First of all, if I went on a date with you and you were like that, there wouldn't be a second. Right? Because relationships require what? Huh? Communication. I want somebody to talk with me, not talk at me. Right? I mean, Alicia told me about her first date with Dustin. It was a nightmare. I'm just joking around. <laughs> y'all know what I'm saying? How many have ever had a nightmare date? Some of y'all don't want to think about it. It's okay. Right? Because that's usually what happened, right? It's just like, man, this conversation can't end fast enough for me. But winning the loss is, is kind of not, first of all, don't go looking for an unbeliever to date <laughs> so you can win them to Jesus, okay? Especially you married folks. Okay? <laughs> Hear, hear me. I'll, I'll wind down in a second. Hear me. But let's say it's a coworker. Let's say it's a neighbor. Let's say it's a childhood friend. Take them, take them out for a cup of coffee. Pay for their meal. Bless them and talk with them because then over time through hanging out, what's going to happen? Tell me. I, something's bothering me. What's bothering me? Why do you never seem to be down? Why is it? It's like you've got this, I don't know. It's like you, you're happy when the rest of the world's miserable. What, is, what, what are you on? That's, what, that's the conversation, right? What you on, man? What are you taking? What are you doing? And then that's when you just look at him and say, I've been waiting. For you to ask me that question. Because there's no high like the most high. Huh? And you tell them about Jesus. Now, don't say there's no high like the most high. They're going to look at you like you're off your rocker. Okay? But to say to them, man, he, Jesus has made a difference in my life. And if you'll let me explain, I know he'll change your life too. This is the most effective way to win the lost. It's when you and I invest in the life of an unbeliever i had a friend in high school um i'm done so y'all be patient with me for a second but i had a friend in high school and i've talked to him about him before his name was abdul and he was a he was born into a muslim family he said he was muslim but he didn't he really wasn't he his parents were and i remember i had somebody in my youth group that told me i shouldn't talk to abdul i said why not they said because you're following jesus they're not and i said but if I don't tell Abdul about Jesus, who will? Because guess what? His parents are telling him about Muhammad. Why can't I tell him about Jesus? So how it all start? This is where I learned relational evangelism. I would say, hey, Abdul, you want to play basketball? And I love playing basketball with Abdul. You know why? I scorched him every time. He could not, <laughs> he couldn't score on me at all. I skunked him every time. And I loved it. And I was like, you want to play basketball? He goes, yeah, I'll take another loss. So we would hang out and play basketball. So we played basketball together five straight times. We never talked about Jesus. We never talked about church. Didn't talk about prayer. Didn't talk about fasting. Didn't talk about any of it. We just hung out. And after the fifth time, I just said to him, I'm a, I'm a sneaky evangelist. I said, dude, you thirsty? He's like, yeah, because I knew my mama was home. I said, let's go get a drink. He's like, all right. So we go in. I introduced them, and you know, some of y'all met my mother. She called, oh, honey, call me a child, and gave him a big old hug, and he was like, and he was like, why is this white woman hugging me? 
I said, relax, man. I said, it's just love. We sit down. We're talking. And she's like, she sits down. She goes, well, honey, tell me about you. What do you, what do you, where are you from? What do you like to do? What do your parents do? Just tell me your story. And then he just, they're talking and they're laughing and they're talking about stuff. And of course, you know, and then I, I helped win him to the Lord, I thought, because I was then began to tell my mother about how I was a much far superior basketball player than Abdul. That really went a long way. That was sarcasm, in case, case you're not paying attention. And when we left, he said, all right, I got to get home. I said, I'll take you home. And he's like, all right. And then my mom, she goes, she goes, now hold on, honey. You ain't leaving my house without a hug. Give him another hug. We get in the car. He's like, dude, what is your mom's deal? I said, what are you talking about? He's like, I never had a white lady hug me so much in my whole life. And I said, well, I said, she's just full of love, man. So the weekend went past sitting in school Monday. He goes, hey, what you doing this weekend? I said, I don't have plans. Why? He goes, you want to play basketball? I said, I'll take another win. <laughs> and he goes, all right, whatever, whatever. He goes, he goes, why don't we play by your house? I'm like, okay, cool. I know what's going on. So we play basketball. I scored him again. And then he goes, all right. He goes, uh, could I bother you for a drink? I said, it's no bother. I said, what is it you're really wanting? He goes, is your mama home? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, she's home. Why? He goes, he goes, I don't know why. He said, I can't explain this. He said, something's been bothering me since I was at your house last. I said, what's bothering you? He said, I don't understand why when your mama hugs me, I feel something that I don't feel when my mama hugs me. And I said, sit down. And he sat down. I said, let me tell you about what my mama has that your mama don't. He said, what's that? I said, his name is Jesus. He's like, dude, I ain't trying to. I said, listen, I'm not preaching. But I'm telling you, my mom is full of the love of Jesus in her heart. And when she hugs you, I said, I said listen to me. It's not my mama hugging you. That's the love of God. And I said, your religion tells you that it's works and it's fear and you have to earn paradise. And I said, but my relationship with God says that I don't earn salvation. I've been given salvation. I said, Muhammad wants you to do everything to hope to get to paradise. I said, but Jesus told me I've already built paradise for you so that you may be where I am. And I said, that's the difference. I said, I don't live in fear. I live in hope. I said, now let's go see my mama. So we go over to the apartment. We come in, and she saw him. She goes, oh, Abdul, boy, you better give me a hug. He wraps her arms around him. And then every day, he's like, your mama home today? I said, dude, now, now you're starting to hug my mama way too much. And you're, starting to, <laughs> you're starting to bother me. My point is this. You don't start with somebody by telling them what's going to happen because they're not saved you got to start by building trust in relationship and then god will do it amen how many in here want to be a soul winner amen stand to your feet with me stand to your feet with me everybody getting baptized go prepare yourselves if you will everybody else lift your hands and i want you just to begin to pray and ask god to make you 